Hi, everybody. My name is DP Layton. I use he, him pronouns, and I am the Assistant Director for Creative Career Services here at the Herberger Institute. If you didn't know, uh, the Herberger Institute actually has its very own career center. Creative Career Services uh, has a lot of locations uh, around all of our Tempe campuses, uh, uh, Tempe and downtown Phoenix. However, um, about 95% of the work that we do is online. Uh, all of our services are available online uh, for all students to access. And even if you're not a student um, or an alumni, you can still access about 75% of the stuff that we have um, as a faculty or staff member, uh, as a community member, an employer, or, or anything else. Um, all of our handouts and stuff like that are available online. Um, today, we are going to talk about resumes. So um, we're going to do a brief presentation. And then for those attendees who are with us here in person, uh, we'll break off afterwards and start reviewing resumes with you. Um, just to let you know, we do have an online resume Dropbox feature where if you go online and you submit your resume to us as a student or an alumni um, and let us know that you're a Herberger Institute student or that uh, you're enrolled in a uh, creative discipline or a creative uh, major or minor, uh, a human being will actually respond to you. Uh, our creative career peers are uh, student leaders enrolled in arts and design programs who actually research uh, hiring trends and such for all of these disciplines. Um, so an actual human being will give you feedback. You can also book live appointments with us one-on-one, -on -one, either in person or online, um, by going to Handshake and scheduling a arts design and performance advising appointment. Um, and if you need those instructions, again, you can always just go to our uh, Creative Career Services website. The easiest way to get it is just Google Herberger Institute Career Services. We're going to be the first link. We're not very difficult to find. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my presentation, and we'll get things kicked off. So the first thing that's important to note about uh, your resume is when you're applying to a specific thing, it's very important to tailor your resumes. If you're applying to an internship, an apprenticeship, a co-op, or anything like that, that's an experiential learning opportunity, uh, typically uh, there is an end date for this type of employment. And typically these are for students who are currently enrolled in a degree program or are within six to eight months after graduating. Um, but an internship, apprenticeship, and all that is about learning as well as doing. Whereas when you're applying to a job, it's not necessarily about, uh, about learning. They don't necessarily care about you learning. They need you to do the job. So with an internship application, you want to tell them not only what you're skilled at, but also what you're looking to learn in that internship. Whereas with a job, again, you need to prove to them that you can hit the ground running, that you've basically already done all the stuff that they need before. When you're applying to grad school or any other continuing education program, uh, they'll typically ask you for a resume and a cover letter and all the other stuff, just like you're applying to a job or internship. Um, but of course, this is all about what you want to learn. There isn't a whole lot about uh, what you can do for that company or that, that graduate school. It's about what you want to learn, what you want to develop, um, as well as what skills prepare you for going into that program. And then, of course, uh, if you're going to be doing freelance stuff, gig work, being an entrepreneur, um, your application materials are going to look different because you're finding clients and you're probably not going to necessarily need what we would consider as a conventional resume, but you will need other types of application materials. So again, um, the advice that we have for you today uh, is going to be along the lines of how you tailor those materials. Um, but when you submit your resume for review, if you're not applying to a specific position, what we're going to be reviewing with you actually is what we call your magnet resume. Um, and that's something a little bit different than a tailored resume to a specific position. Uh, and all of those applications should be tailored to each job and internship uh, and college program and whatever you are applying to. So this is the slide that Central Career and Professional Development Services and ASU that speaks with like lawyers and, uh, you know, business professionals and uh, medical professionals and all those other majors. This is the kind of formatting resume that they give. Um, those resumes typically follow a conventional format and almost like a template, but arts and design resumes are very different. Um, there is no template for creative resumes. And so this is the adjusted checklist. 
So just like with the previous checklist, no templates. Um, I have been a hiring manager for over a decade now. And now that I work in career services, uh, if I'm looking at applicants, I can make about eight piles of the same resume format. Uh, even if you're just changing the color or tweaking something around, we can tell that you started with a template. Our recommendation is um, if you find a template that you like, um, see how you can emulate that. Go on Google and look for XYZ resumes and see what type of styles you enjoy. See what sections uh, look good to you and, and what you want to emulate. And then create it yourself. Um, if you go on YouTube and type in whatever platform you're interested in using and resumes, um, it'll teach, you'll find some tutorials on how to make your own template. Um, but the word template there is really important. Very often I see designers who create this in something like Photoshop or InDesign, and then when they need to tailor it, when they need to edit it, all the formatting is weird and it takes way longer. Um, it doesn't have to be a crazy uh, intricate design of a resume. It should be a template that you can adjust over time and add to. Um, it does not have to be in black and white. Uh, very often they are in color. I would say about 50 to 75% of creative resumes have some form of color in them, but it should work in black and white. Um, I always say, you know, no kids' birthday party invitations, like, you know, a uh, green typeface on a blue background, because when you print that out, it's all gray. Um, and also, you know, I, uh, I one time had a student resume where there was like a color, uh, a watercolor splotch on the side. And when you print that out in grayscale, it looks like a smudge and not good. So just make sure you view it in black and white and that it's working. Um, we don't care about margins or spacing or anything like that. You're a creative. Uh, very often, especially for designers and stuff, your job is going to be taking boring information and boring stuff and making it look pretty and interesting. Your resume is your first impression about how you uh, organize information uh, into interesting formats as a creative professional. So it should have appropriate spacing. The reasons that historically and typically like in school and stuff, you have certain specific margins is so that teachers and, and people can write comments in, in the sides. The reason that it's double spaced is so they can do things like underlining. Sometimes it's for ease of reading for dyslexic people like myself. Uh, and sometimes too, those margins are for like making sure that a printer doesn't cut it off. Nine times out of 10, an employer, a grad school people, they, they're not gonna be uh, printing off your resume. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, but it should have appropriate spacing. Again, if you just go online and you look for types of uh, types of resumes, you can find how people are adjusting the spacing. It should be an easy to read font. And I don't mean just by a human being, by a computer as well. Um, so if a computer is scanning it, it's not gonna understand cursive. So make sure that it's doing that. And then also never put any sections in a vertical uh, type format, meaning you're twisting the words into um, vertical instead of horizontal, because a computer cannot read that. 75% of employers use what's called an applicant tracking system, which is a computer that scans your resume, cover letter, and other application materials before a human being even looks at them. And that uh, is going to get you in a lot of trouble if you are not tailoring your resume and you're doing too crazy of a design. Your name needs to be prominent. It shouldn't be the same. It shouldn't be half of your page, but it should not be the same weight as other stuff or smaller than other stuff on your uh, resume. It should also be at the very top of your page. And we're going to go through some examples here in just a second. So I like using this example of what's wrong here. Um, so take a second look at this. If you're recording, if you're watching this video, maybe pause it um, and take a look and maybe see what's wrong here. But we're going to go in here and, and go top down. So first of all, we've got Leo. Um, I don't have a last name. I, I, I need to know what Leo's last name is. That doesn't give me a lot. Um, second, we have an address. Um, do not include your address anymore. Uh, an address is left over from when a cover letter was actually a letter that was going on the cover uh, of a fax you were sending or a packet that you would actually mail out to employers. They don't need to know where you live. They'll get your address information if you are hired on and they need it for HR purposes. At very most, just put the city and state that you're living in. 
Um, we'll also notice here, phone numbers are absolutely important. You have to have a phone number, but I have no idea what Leo's area code is, so I can't even, I can't even call Leo. Um, you'll also notice under that, the email address is very immature. Remember before I was telling you about the differences between jobs and internships and applications? Uh, with here, if you're applying to an internship, use your student email because very often they need you to be a student or an alumni. If you're applying to a job, use your own personal professional email address and not your student because that can infantilize you and make them concerned like, oh, this is a student. Are they going to be able to do the job? And then the last thing, you absolutely must create a LinkedIn profile. I don't even care if your industry doesn't use it that often. You still need to create one. Um, make sure you're continuing to update it um, and make a short link. You'll see here, there is a lot of letters and numbers after that. I'm dyslexic. The likelihood that I'm going to be able to type that in accurately is slim to none. So if you just Google LinkedIn short link, you'll be able to find a resource on how to uh, make your LinkedIn profile into a short link. So we'll see here, this is good formatting. Um, so the student's name is prominent. They've got their LinkedIn information. Um, an area code and uh, their student email. Um, now you'll notice that there's two different formats here. Um, I personally like the top one because that's kind of like a little letterhead. Um, my recommendation to students is to always actually maybe take like an hour of your time, maybe two hours, um, go online and Google making your own letterhead and make your own letterhead so that your contact information at the top of the page for your resume, for your cover letter, if you're a contractor for your invoices, um, any letters of recommendation that you are sending out to others, they're all visually looking the same. You have a cohesive brand that you are presenting yourself as. So then now we're on to education. Typically education is the next thing on your resume. However, each industry is a little bit different. Um, so my recommendation is Send your resume to a professional in that industry. Try and set up a meeting with your faculty um, and go online and Google XYZ resumes to see, does education go at the top or the bottom? Where do they have their skills section? Things like that. But typically education is the very next thing under your name and contact information. Um, and we'll see here uh, some information that is uh, important to highlight. So um, first of all, we see with formatting, um, Ceramics and criminology are underscored. Dean's list is under, uh, sorry, as uh, not capitalized. You need to capitalize all those. Second of all, not everyone knows what a BFA is or the acronym for your degree. Make sure you're typing it out, Bachelor of Fine Arts, um, because sometimes a computer is going to look for that word bachelor's or master's, and they're going to turn around to that human and say, hey, you know what? Uh, they don't have a bachelor's degree. They got something called a BFA, but I don't see bachelor's anyways. Uh, they're not qualified. Um, you'll also uh, see that it's ASU Barrett the Honors College. Not everyone knows what Barrett is necessarily. Not everyone knows like kind of what Herberger Institute is, um, but also it's going uh, in weird orders. So you want to start small to large or large to small. So either start large to small, ASU Herberger Institute, and then your degree or small to large your degree and minor, if it's relevant, then Herberger Institute, maybe Barrett the Honors College, and then Arizona State University. Um, you'll also see on the right-hand side, uh, 2019 to present. Um, don't put present, just put the month and year that you're graduating. Um, they know that you're not a time traveler. They know that that's coming up in the future, um, but also they don't need to know the time range that it took you to graduate. Um, they just need to know the month and year. And honestly, that's really just for HR um, and for them to get an idea of how long you've been out of school. Um, if you are adding your GPA with creative fields, it's not really necessary, um, but put it out of what the score is because I think like in Canada, it's out of six. In India, I think it's out of eight. Like different countries or regions have different GPA standards. So if they think that it's out of a 6.0 and you're putting 3.2, that's gonna look kind of bad. So this is uh, an appropriate way of doing it. So notice what we just talked about. It's May 2025. Uh, we have the GPA out of 4.0, um, and then we have things formatted well. One of the things I want to highlight here is notice that um, we're using bold, regular, and italics to separate visually that information. I mentioned before, I'm dyslexic. I need visual cues to let me know when we're switching from one piece of information to the other. 
To that end, it also needs to be cohesive. When we're getting from education into uh, job history or volunteer experiences or anything like that, how you structure the information from small to large or large to small, how you organize the dates, uh, either uh, all left justified or right justified or two columns or one or anything like that, um, how you use bold and italics and underlines and all that, it needs to be consistent. So keep an eye out for that. So experiences are not just jobs. They are jobs, internships, part-time or full-time, even if they're not relevant to your creative discipline, it doesn't matter. There's always relevant experience that you can share with people, those transferable skills. Um, accomplishment statements are the bullet points under each of your jobs, internships, volunteer experiences, community service, things like that, um, clubs and organizations. Um, they are those bullet points um, and they follow a very simple format. Action verb, project, result. Uh, very often, what I find nine times out of 10 when reviewing a student's resume is they, they haven't added results. The result is, why are you doing the thing that you're doing? Or why did you do that thing? Yes, you made coffee as a barista, but like, what was the result of that? Um, were you able to connect with customers? Were you able to build relationships with your, uh, with your uh, coworkers? Um, were you able to learn about a computer system? What is that result there? So in here, we see some uh, bad uh, experience and accomplishment statements. Um, notice on the right-hand side, we'll start there, 2018 to 2019. I don't know if that's December 2018 to January 2019, which is two months, or January 2018 to December 2019, which is two years. You need to give them a month and date, just like you did in education. Um, for uh, and, and this is one, unlike your education, if you are currently in that job, that this is where you write current or present. Um, but you'll also notice in here, um, they've just put Phoenix for the location. They haven't put the state. Uh, there might be other Phoenixes out there that aren't located in Arizona. So you wanna give them a, a, a location, a state as well as a location. Um, you'll notice these accomplishment statements are very boring. Took coffee orders for customers. That doesn't really give me a lot of information relevant to my job. Resolved customer service issues. That's a little bit more on the money, that, that helps me, but it doesn't really give me a why behind why they resolved the customer service issues or what that resulted in or what they learned or anything. Um, so this is a little bit more of a robust profile. So notice a uh, robust experience. So we have the dates in there, the month and year. Um, we've added in Arizona there, um, and we have a lot more of a robust accomplishment statement. So you didn't just make coffee. You communicated with up to 300 customers during a four-hour period in a fast-paced environment, and that result with successful delivery. So that action verb, remember, make sure that they are action verbs and not passive verbs. There's a great resource on our website um, called Resume Action Verbs, and actually a lot of other people online have put these together. Um, so if you just Google Resume Action Verbs, there's some really great action verbs um, that'll actually tell you what's a passive verb versus what you can do as an active verb. And if you're like me and you put communicated or facilitated too often, it's a thesaurus. So we'll give you other ideas for other verbs that you can add in there to not be redundant. Um, so again, we've got situation, um, you know, that, that action verb, uh, that project or situation, and then the result. So troubleshot um, and then maintain and quality service. Uh, so again, we've got those three components there. Um, another important thing is if you are still currently doing the job, it's present tense. If you have already stopped doing the job, it's past tense. Um, so make sure to highlight that. Um, these are the career competencies. Um, there's really great handouts online uh, to explain a little bit more of this to you. But these are basically the eight basic skill sets that every single employer cares about, regardless of age, industry, or experience. So things like critical thinking and technology, teamwork and collaboration and leadership. Every single one of the bullet points under your jobs and experiences can and should relate to one or more of these transferable skills. If they are not, uh, read it. And if it doesn't align with one of these, go in and rewrite it. And another great thing to do is when you're reading that job description, read it like a homework assignment. What career competencies, what skills are they looking for? And how do I tailor it to that specific position? Do they care more about leadership or more about teamwork? 
Do they care a lot about technology or maybe they really care about diversity and inclusion? Um, what are they looking for and how do I make sure that I'm adding that into my resume in those accomplishment statements? So the next one is skills. Um, again, some things we might think are wrong here. So first of all, Adobe Creative Cloud, there's like 500 applications in the Creative Cloud. There's a bunch that I know you've never even heard about or touched. If they're looking for Photoshop and InDesign, if they're looking for you know, uh, a specific software system that you've used before, tell them that. Literally write out those, uh, those skills if they're in that job post. Um, team player, that is not necessarily a hard skill. That is a soft skill. Um, that's not something I can measure you on. Neither is lover of books. And those should go in your accomplishment statements to prove to them. Lover of books, that can go in your cover letter to explain a little bit more in a, in a letter to them. Speaking uh, English and Spanish fluently in reading, that's a sentence and that's not a bullet point. So one thing that I recommend is actually breaking them up into different columns. You don't have to do this, but it's, it's really great, especially for um, uh, visual arts people. Um, breaking them up into software, hardware, and industry knowledge and industry know-how. We take a look here and think, maybe pause the video and think, hey, what software do I know versus what's the hardware? For me as a photographer, we've got the software for editing and stuff, but then I also have all this hardware of cameras and lighting equipment and things like that. And then I also have industry knowledge of how to work with models on set and how to work with talent agencies and, and things like that. So. Um, these are some things to think about with skills. Again, we want industry knowledge and technology and hardware, even special languages and stuff like that. But don't put personality traits because I can't measure you on that. There are a lot of other optional resume sections that aren't just your name and contact info, your education, your uh, experience and your skills. You can type in even relevant courses, community involvement and volunteer history. Um, obviously your internships go under experiences, but even your course projects um, could count because you've got a boss, your, your teacher, you've got uh, a assignment, your homework assignment, your, the, the, you know, thing that you're doing is kind of like your job. Um, you've got a timeline where that deliverable is due and you've got compensation, your grade. All of those are four basic components of a job. You just did it in school. So if you don't have a lot of history in the workforce, you can still find other things that are relevant. Um, later on in your career too, depending on your discipline, you will probably get certain licensures and certifications, and those will go under your education section, but they're gonna kind of be their own thing. So we've talked a little bit about that tailored resume, reading that job description like it's a homework assignment, give the people what they want, because they only get to know one page version of a resume of you and a one page cover letter of who you are as a person. They're going to be interviewing you. You can you can explain a little bit more about yourself later on, but that one page has to sell you as the perfect applicant. Your magnet resume, this isn't to a specific position. This is kind of like your vision board, an idealized version of yourself. If I pick this up off the ground and I've never met you before, I should know what your background is, what you're skilled in, and kind of like what type of work you're looking for. Um, what we really recommend in our department, and believe me, this will save your butt uh, later on down the line, especially if you're really hitting the pavement and you're really looking for jobs and internships right now, start creating what we call a parts resume or a master resume. This doesn't have to be a fancy formatted document. It can be an unformatted document. But instead of just three or five bullet points under everything, instead of just a handful of skills, every single time you write a new bullet point, relevant to that job, you copy it and paste it into your parts resume. That way, as, you're, as you keep going further and further along and start applying to more and more jobs, you're not having to rewrite everything every single time. You just copy and paste it. So it's like, okay, this company, let's take ASU for example. They care a lot about innovation. Herberger Institute cares a lot about creativity. Um, ASU in general is very committed to diversity and inclusion with our charter. So I would go to my parts resume and be like, okay, diversity, copy, paste, copy, paste. Um, okay, career services, copy, paste, do that. Uh, they're looking for um, creativity. Oh, okay, I, I should probably write something. I'm going to save that over. It becomes a lot easier over time to just copy and paste those things. 
than having to rewrite it all the time. So that brings us to the end of our session. If you are watching or you're in our crowd right now, you can go ahead and scan this uh, QR code to go to our uh, website right now, um, just so it's in your search history. Again, we have a lot of great services available to you uh, as a student and alumni. Um, and even if you're not, we still have other resources that you can access 24 seven. Um, right now, I'm going to stop recording and we're going to do our breakout sessions. But I just want to thank everybody for joining us and tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you very soon. Bye-bye.